James Callum. I'm one of the founder members of the Lions Part. As I'm sure you're aware, at this time of year we would normally be getting ready for our October Plenty Festival on Bankside. But uh, this year, for obvious reasons, that's not happening, so we're going online instead. So over the next uh, couple of weeks, before October the 25th, when the event will be happening online, we're going to be doing a few workshops and telling you about um, the preparations that we sometimes make for these shows. One of the things that I work with, particularly for the Lions part, is costume. It's something that I find very interesting. And um, sometimes our costumes are fantastical, sometimes they're based on folk tradition. But a number of uh, our costumes have been fairly carefully based in the sorts of clothes that people used to wear in the time of William Shakespeare. One of the songs that uh, we used to sing quite frequently at Borough Market were the Cries of London, which were the sorts of calls that travelling merchants would shout out to advertise their wares, walking from street to street, calling out that they had marking stones to sell, or fine lines, or cotton, or ribbons, or whatever it might be. So we've been doing this song for a while, and interestingly, uh, in the later part of the 17th century, the famous diarist Samuel Pepys came across some woodcuts depicting the kind of people that used to make these calls. They still survive, so we've got a very good idea as to how people would have looked, those street vendors. And um, I just wondered if it would be possible to try and recreate some of those clothes. So we're going to have a go. So where do we begin? Well, underwear, of course. And 400 years ago, for most people in Western Europe, that means this. A linen shirt for the men, or a linen smock for women. Now, it's made of linen because that grows in Europe, unlike cotton, which has to come a very long way and is very, very expensive. And it also serves a really important purpose, which I'll tell you about once I've put it on. So, here I am, in my undershirt. And uh, it's very, very simple. It's just a couple of rectangles sewn together by hand. Very, very simple neckband. And then this one doesn't have any buttons on it. It's just tied together at the cuffs and at the neck. It's very, very simple. Now, this smart, nice, clean white shirt hopefully will keep my garments that go on top nice and clean but it will also keep me clean because if you can imagine 400 years ago it's quite difficult to take a bath so lots of people didn't but what they did do was to change their shirt as often as they possibly could rich people would change it on a daily basis if not more poorer people would change it slightly less often but i've been told by people who have experimented with this it actually works Linen will absorb all of your bodily greases and if you take that shirt off, give it a good old wash and put on a clean one, then you'll keep fragrant. And if you're thinking, oh, that shirt looks really, really white, well, I think the Elizabethans were very good at laundry. There's certainly plenty of evidence to say that they knew exactly what they were doing. And if you want to give it a go yourself, take a, a grimy linen shirt and uh, leave it in a bucket of fermented urine for a few days to get rid of the stains. Then rinse it out, give it a really good wash in soap or lye and then, once it's been rinsed clean, hang it out on a bush on a sunny day in the garden or just lay it on some grass. And the sunlight and the chlorophyll from the green leaves actually work as a bleach. So middle class Elizabethans were able to look very, very smart if they wanted to. And I think most of them probably did. So there we go. That's the first part of my underwear. I'm a little bit chilly down below. I need to put on something there as well. So, since I'm trying to portray someone in these woodcuts, a fairly low citizen who's going about the streets selling his wares, I'm not going to wear anything particularly fancy. In fact, this suit here, as much as I like it, it's probably not really appropriate for what I'm about to do. So, I'm going to be wearing stuff that is available to the lower sorts. And to keep my legs warm and protected, I'm going to put on these. A pair of hand-knitted woolen stockings. Now these haven't been dyed, this is just natural colour of the sheep, so most of my clothes are going to be fairly drab. So I've had to pull back a bit so that you can see my stockings on, and uh, as I said they are pure wool and they're hand knitted so they cling quite well, but during a day they would begin to make their way down just as you're moving around. So to try and stop that from happening I'm going to put on a pair of garters. Again they're made of wool, hand knitted. And uh, these ones have been dyed in a lovely shade of blue, which was one of the colours that was quite affordable for the lower sorts. 
blues and reds and oranges, things like that. That's the colour scape you've got really. And uh, I'm tying the garter under my knee, crossing it behind, and then tying it over my knee. And that's what's called cross gartering, which you might be aware of from Shakespeare's play Twelfth Night, where Malvolio is fooled into wearing yellow stockings cross gartered. Um, and that's what it is, really. Um, he says it causes much constriction in the blood, but it's not too bad, in fact. So next, I'm going to need my breeches. Like those worn by the one of the merchants in the woodcuts, these are very, very simple. I suppose you could call them Venetians, using terms of their day. They're not the big padded type trunk hose. And uh, these, again, they're made of undyed wool. And in fact, this fabric has been specially woven to try and recreate one of the fabrics that was very common 400 years ago called russet. So the buttons here, a little bit fiddly, they're handmade from linen. And once I've done these up, I will then put on my doublet. I'm probably going to cut away now because it's a bit fiddly doing these. Before I go on to the doublet, there's something I forgot. My shoes. I probably ought to put those on now to save my stockings from getting worn out. Now these ones are about as close as I can get to the ones seen in the uh, woodcuts without having any new ones specially made. So these are made from cowhide leather and uh, they're dyed black and they're in that fashionable shape of the latchet which has this big hole cut out at the side. I'm not sure why but it just seems to be one of the fashions of the time. It lasts throughout the whole of the 17th century pretty much. So I've let forward a little bit, I've put the doublet on, I've pointed it to my breeches and I've done some of the buttons up because it's not terribly interesting to watch. So this is pure linen canvas, it's um, very very simple and again I think fairly appropriate for one of these street vendors. All these buttons are quite fiddly and I think to some extent that was a status symbol. They're actually very practical as well because these doublets are designed to be quite um, fitted and uh, if your buttons aren't close together then it tends to gape in a rather unattractive way. So you can see it's quite high-waisted, quite fitted and uh, that's a very very basic look. I think I need to put something on round here and I need a hat and possibly a belt as well. <laughs> So I've now added uh, a very simple uh, collar, or falling band as they might have called it, uh, as opposed to a ruff such as the mannequin is wearing here. Ruffs, they were very, very fashionable, but quite high maintenance in some ways. Um, this one which I made, it's got um, six metres of linen in it, and for it to be smartly dressed it needs to be starched and poked and set in a very very rigid manner and I think that was probably a little bit too much hassle for quite a few of the people although in one of the woodcuts the uh, the gold merchant he is very clearly wearing uh, a ruff but I'm just going to go with the falling band that uh, our rope seller has and that's the one I'm going to do. Uh, in most of the woodcuts we also see that they're wearing a belt around their waists and belts 400 years ago a little bit different to perhaps a modern belt. This one, it adjusts at the side, but it does up at the front. So there's this very simple clasp there. Um, this clasp I actually had made as a replica of an original uh, belt clasp made for me by, by a blacksmith who's also a specialist armourer. So that goes on around my waist and uh, also it has hangers on it so that if I were of a slightly higher status I might be able to suspend my sword from there. So I've now got the belt or girdle on and uh, you can see the reason for this class being as it is is so that the belt can follow the line of my doublet. Uh, on some doublets it seems though there'd be little loops here and you'd actually tie the belt onto your doublet to make sure that it followed that line. So I'm almost done, I just need a head covering. It would have been considered a little bit strange not to have your head covered. So um, I need to put on a hat. So this is about as near as I can get to that that's seen in the woodcut. It's a very simple sugarloaf shape and it's made from felted wool. 
So uh, that's me pretty much done. I think with a little bit of theatrical magic I need to create myself a slightly more Elizabethan look and to get a couple of things to sell. So that's my attempt at recreating one of those characters seen in the Cries of London woodcuts collected by Samuel Pepys. Between now and October the 25th, when the October Plenty will be online, there's going to be things for you to join in with. Have a look at our Facebook page and our YouTube channel as well. On October the 22nd, I'll be doing a hat decorating workshop. If you've ever been to October Plenty, you'll see that we have a lot of decorative hats. So get together a hat some flowers, some ribbons, some leaves, fruits and nuts, anything you want to put on them to decorate your hat in harvest style. We'll see you soon.